and welcome to Olivia's Book Club, the podcast. I am your host, Olivia Fierro, joined by Margaret Stewart, who is in the studio. She's going to be going through some recommendations of books that you should read, and we're going to be breaking down what are the most read books so far, at least according to Goodreads and the 2021 Book Challenge, and see which ones have stood out to us so far. But we got to get to this very exciting guest. Kristen Harmel is joining us today, and I am so excited about this. 2021, well, of course, it's an improvement from 2020, but this is a really (laughs) good year for Kristen's fans because not only is the Book of Lost Names released in paperback, I'm carrying the hardcover right now, but also she has got a new book and it is absolutely beautiful. The Forest of Vanishing Stars, an instant bestseller, of course, as it should be. And Kristen, I mean, it just is a remarkable book, the kind of beautiful book that is going to stay with the reader forever. And you may want to revisit again and again. So thank you so much for joining us today. I'm super excited to talk to you. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. And thank you so much for the kind words about the book. Talk to me about when you first got the idea for this. This book to me was very surprising because it was almost like um, it it almost floats between genres. I mean, it almost starts It's obviously very, um, you know, a serious background during the time of World War II and uh, fleeing from the Nazis. But it's also almost there's a fairy tale element to it at the beginning and and there's fantasy and there's. Um, it is, it's just, I, I thought it was an incredible journey. Well, thank you so much. Yeah, the um, the beginning does have a little bit of a different tone to the rest of the book. You're absolutely right. The beginning of the book does feel a little bit like a dark fairy tale. And that's because the first two chapters unfold from the point of view of this woman named Yerusha, who feels that she's been called by the forest, by God, to kidnap a little girl, to take her deep into the woods, to raise her in total isolation and to give her a different life. So that's kind of why it starts off with that dark fairy tale feel, because you sort of need to understand why Yerusha is doing this and, and, you know, what, what her, what her motivation is, but then it kind of unfolds into more traditional historical fiction in that it becomes a story about a young woman who, um, finds herself in the forests of Eastern Poland and whose life in 1942 intersects with that of a family of fleeing Jewish refugees. And she's faced with this decision of whether she helps them um, or whether she retreats to this life of safety within the forest that she's always been told is the only way forward. Um, And so I like to say, of course, she chooses to help them or it would be a very short novel and you probably would not be talking about it. (laughs) She's disappointed with her latest. (laughs) <laughs> but um, it kind of turns into the story based on the true stories of real life Jewish refugees who survived the war by fleeing into the forests of Eastern Europe, which in and of itself is just extraordinary. It's almost unbelievable that these real stories happened, but they did. So it was such a great honor to tell those stories. But because this young woman named Yona, who was kidnapped as a child by this woman, Yerusha, because it's her story at the heart of it, it's also a story of identity. It's a story of coming of age. It's a story about learning how to um, to interact with other humans and learning how you build um, the core of who you are as you move through life. Her tale and her evolution is, it's so heartbreaking, but then also fascinating. Um, She's really deprived of a lot of love and affection that maybe she would have gotten from her parents. Maybe she wouldn't have, but we certainly assume that she would have all for the purpose of her being prepared to sort of change destiny for this group of people. But it, yeah. at the heart, she's a young woman who wants to be loved and wants to be cared for and wants to be thought about yeah. and supported. And so she's lacking in that human connection. And so her her journey to sort of find out how to be with other people is yeah. really remarkable. Yeah, th- uh, thank you. Um, to me, that was kind of at the core of the story, just this idea of how do you learn to love? How do you learn to live? How do you learn um, the meaning of, of all the 
nuances of human interaction if you've never been exposed to them. And so it, it very much is a story about identity. And I think that a lot of our identity is found in that, is found in that way that we communicate with each other, the way we deal with each other, the way we react to other people's reactions, things like that. Um, but, I, you know, I think also in terms of identity being at the core of this, the idea that she wasn't raised by parents who loved her because she's taken from her parents. She's not raised by them. And this idea that she really does have this childhood mostly devoid of love is interesting too, because how do you find your way back to that? How do you find your way back to how to love, how to, how to be loved, how to give love, all of these things, if you have no real model for that? So that's something she kind of works through too in this story. And it's kind of um, fascinating to see as she begins to, I mean, she, she obviously has this incredible heart and, and a, a, was the right person to be called to this role, to be helping people and, and shepherding them through a crisis and really keeping people alive. But there's so much that she just doesn't understand. And I thought that yeah. some of the interactions in particular with women yeah. who are snarky or there's, there's subtle, subtle digs or tension, or she starts to try to observe like regular human stuff that we would all be, you know, really easy to pick up on. She starts to observe attention in a voice, but doesn't really understand what's going on. So she's also childlike in having to learn on the fly as a beautiful, obviously young woman, um, the way that jealousy and suspicion kind of get in the way of yes. common sense. Well, it's true. And these were things she never had to deal with because everything with the woman who kidnapped her and raised her was very strange, but it was always very straightforward. She always knew exactly where she stood. Um, and now suddenly, as you said, she's being exposed to these feelings like jealousy and, um, and sort of this pettiness that she doesn't understand. And at her heart, she's just trying to do the right thing for people. But because some of these people she's interacting with come from a normal society where, you know, we, unfortunately, in a normal society, we stab each other in the back, we do the wrong thing, we're jealous of each other, we, you know, sleep with each other's, you know, boyfriends or husbands or what I mean, I don't. But <laughs> But, you know, these are the things that unfold in society. And though that's the baggage that these people are kind of carrying into the forest with them. And Yona is really struggling to understand what that baggage means and, and why people are treating her that way and why they don't just accept that she's trying to help them, um, which was an interesting thing to explore because it made me think about, well, what are all these artificial things that we put in the way? of doing the right thing, of feeling the right thing, of being totally open to each other. And I think the older we get, the more we tend to have built these artificial walls of, um, of suspicion around ourselves, even if we don't realize we've done it. There's an element to also the, the storytelling and her, her story in particular that makes us all think, you know, do we bear uh, the burden of responsibility for the yeah. crimes of our family or the yeah. crimes of the generations that have come before us and maybe the, the benefits that we yeah. enjoy because of what has been done yep. wrongly to others. And that's sort of a conflict that um, is played out internally with yes. her. And uh, that, that is that, that thought process, I thought was a really interesting subtext, you know, for this story. Thank you. Yeah, that's really at the heart of her journey. I mean, it, it is a question of, are you who you were born to be? Are you who you were raised to be? Or are you who you make yourself? Or are you some combination of those three? Um, and, you know, I think that is a question that she faces throughout the novel. I think it's a question probably we've all faced in some way, shape, or form through our own lives. But I think it's really a question that, um, that's particularly relevant now in 2021, when these are a lot of the questions we're talking about. You know, how much of our pasts are we responsible for? And, and I don't know that I have all the answers to that. I don't think Yona has the answers to it in the novel, but I think they're important questions to ask. And I will share something interesting about that, though. I think 
at the beginning of writing this novel, I would have told you if you had said how much of our past stories, how much of our ancestor stories do we carry forward? Do we have a responsibility for or how, how much of that is a piece of us? I think I would have said it's a small part of us, but maybe not the part that drives us. Um, but I was midway through writing this book when I found out that my dad's side of the family, um, who I knew, uh, I knew his side of the family was Jewish, but I had never known that his side of the family were Polish Jews from an area not far away from the area I was writing about in this novel. And I primarily write about World War II Paris. This book was a total departure for me. This, I mean, the, the storyline is very much in line with my other books, but the setting and kind of the events in the book are a little bit different. Um, but I cannot tell you where, that, where the idea for this came from, why I was so drawn to writing about Eastern Poland. And it turns out that I basically on the direct family tree had a tie to that area and to those stories after all. Um, and I, that was something I didn't expect to discover. And it's something that reframed, I think, my own thinking about the stories that we carry with us. Because in a way, that must have been a story that somehow was a was a part of me was was in my blood. I mean, what, how I I honestly cannot explain why else, um, why else this appealed to me so much to write about. Wow, that's interesting. And there, I know that there's a lot of research in psychology about you know generational yeah. trauma and, and yes, kind of what's imprinted yeah. in in our DNA and those stories and that history. So to kind of tap into that or observe yes. that, um, it, it, oh, how fascinating! It it really is, and fascinating that that this came about while I was writing a story about what makes you who you are and what forms your identity. It was almost like, you know, these things swirling together, trying to give me the right answers or something. And I still don't have them. So clearly I'm not Who's listening. communicating well enough. with me right now? What is happening? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So how, how does your research process go? And, and I also, I, I find especially you wildly successful authors who are able to follow up one wildly successful on all levels, whether you're talking about, you know, commercial success but, and mostly storytelling success, one great book with another great book with no reservation, hesitation about flopping after something is so well received. I mean, what do you, how do you sit down to start all over again? Well, that's a great question. And I will tell you that it's, um, it's a sequence of paralyzing fear each time. So, so don't, don't think that I'm not, you know, frightened by that. Cause you're right. When you have a success, it should give you a little bit more um, courage, right? That like, okay, I know how to do this. I can, I could do this again, but the little voices in your head just say like, what if, what, you know, what if I've done it? What if I've written my best book? What if the best times are all behind me? I go through that every time, but I think that's also what helps keep me from being complacent. Um, and, and that helps me moving to, to continue moving forward. So one of the reasons I think, in addition to obviously just feeling some calling, I can't explain. One of the reasons that I think I wanted to move out of France for this book was that I had written several novels in World War II France, and I wanted to try something different. So moving to an area of the world I didn't know as well, um, and moving to a forest, which I'm not a super outdoorsy person. So it truly like, so having to learn survival skills um, and to learn truly how you would survive years in a forest was very outside my comfort level. And I think it's a really good thing to push yourself outside of your comfort zone um, every now and then, because I think that's how you grow. I think that's how you learn what you're capable of and learn what you can do. But in terms of research for this book, um, I always start off with just months of reading everything I can get my hands on, which includes survivor testimony, um, you know, firsthand recollections of people who were in the forest, for example, in the case of this book. But in this book also, I had the wonderful opportunities of speaking to uh, a man named Aaron Bielski, who's 94 now. He was 14 when he went into the forest with his older brothers in 1941. Um, and together they formed a group that's known as the Bielski Partisans, named after him and his brothers. They were the ones who formed the group. Um, and they out wound up saving more than 1,200 Jewish lives during the war, uh, more than 1,200 people who hid in the forest with them. So that was extraordinary. And speaking to Aaron Bielski 80 years later about his experiences was very moving. I also had the opportunity to speak to um, at length and repeatedly to a man named uh, Vadim Sidorovich, 
who is an expert in the forest at the heart of this novel. So every single minute question I had about how something worked in the forest or how they executed this particular survival skill or you know what herb they would have used to clot blood or how they would have sheltered, all of these little things, I was able to email him and ask and he really brought the forest alive for me. So I think the research is always a combination between reading to get the framework and then going down every single um, a potential rabbit hole you come across as long as you remember to come back up again. <laughs> so did this mean that we could see you on some sort of a celebrity survivor or a, <laughs> what is it? The one that we watched with my, my husband loves to watch naked and afraid, you know, something like that. Um, that's a big no. Um, so <laughs> You, I mean, you could see me on it, but I'd probably be done in about six hours. So, which, you know, truly that is part of thinking about what the lives of these survivors must have been like. None of these people headed in their life plans to flee into the forest and live for years surviving that way. Um, but they did. And, um, and that reminds me that we're all capable of more than we think. So although I have no immediate plans to be on <laughs> Naked and Afraid or whatever it is, Never say never, I guess, right? No, no. <laughs> if it came down to true survival, not just, you know, a television show, then I'm sure we could do it, right? <laughs> right, exactly. That's true. Yeah, and it's, I was just uh, uh, writing up um, a, a portion of an interview from, uh, with, with another author where we were right, talking about the exiles and oh, how- Oh, Christina great... Baker-Klein. I love oh, her. Right. She's fantastic. So great. And it's, it's just, historical fiction especially does- such a great thing for the reader when we're being introduced to a moment in time that we don't have any knowledge of. So yeah. not only are you learning, but when it's done right, like you all do, you're lost in the story, but then you've also yes. been exposed to something that we really, you know, should, ha should have been aware of. And, and, and this, this being a perfect example of it, I did not know that this was a space yeah. where people really survived and waited out um, the occupation to be over. Yeah, it, it's absolutely incredible. And that is one of my favorite things about historical fiction, both reading it and writing it. Um, it, it, it is that idea that you can fall into a story because your heart connects you to the story, right? Because you, you're rooting for the main characters, you care about them. But at the end of the day, if your heart has sent a message to your brain and now you have, you know, now you have this historical reference that you didn't have before, I hope that I've now given you something you can go forward with and know, you just know a little bit more about the world and a little bit more about these true stories that came before us that should inspire us, that should teach us about everybody's ability to do extraordinary things in the face of darkness, right? Um, but, you know, historical fiction for me, and I, it's only been the last couple of years I've really realized this, and I've been writing historical fiction for more than a decade now, but I think one of the things that's really powerful about historical fiction is this idea that you can connect to people from different time periods, right? Who lived through things that we really can't imagine living through, but we can feel these connections to these people who really lived, who really had these stories, because even across the generations, right, even across the years, even across different continents, um, perhaps across different races or different religions or different ethnic backgrounds or whatever, we're all just human, right? So I think that there's something about reading about the past that reminds us of that. When you can connect to a story that doesn't actually have that much to do with you, that underscores that idea that all human stories have to do with all of us because deep down, we're all the same. We all want the same things wherever we are in time, wherever we are in the world. That was one of the great things about reading it. I think it really yep. uh, contributes to our, our sense of empathy and being able yes. to just, yep. just relate to others in, in a way that we wouldn't have otherwise. Um, I meant to yep. say in our intro that another reason why this is a wonderful year is because you are giving another gift to the people who love your writing and by the friends and fiction. So, I mean, talk about, gosh, um, doing something positive, making a positive out of a negative time period. Um, tell me all about how this came to be. And for those of our listeners who have not heard about this yet, well, what can they you. expect? Thank you so much for asking. Friends in Fiction is something I'm so proud of. Um, so at the beginning of the pandemic, back in April 2020, um, I founded a group called Friends in Fiction with four other writers. So it's me, Mary Kay Andrews, 
Mary Alice Monroe, Patty Callahan Henry, and Christy Woodson Harvey were all New York Times bestselling authors. We all had books coming out at the beginning of the pandemic, and we all had book tours that were canceled because the world basically, I mean, you all remember the world just shut down like that. So we thought, how can we continue connecting with our readers if we're not going to be out on the road? How can we give readers a place to come where they can connect with each other? And how can we support independent booksellers who are obviously going to be impacted by this pandemic? And the answer, which we thought was going to go for seven weeks, was Friends in Fiction. So we started April 15th. We said we'll do it through May 27th because obviously by the end of May, things will be back to normal. <laughs> so we all know how that ended because that was May 2020 we were talking about. But in the meantime, I think we realized we were on to something. People, we found that people love to come and connect with other readers, with us, with each other. Um, our group is now over 45,000 members. It's a Facebook group. It's called Friends and Fiction. And every Wednesday night, we're live on Facebook at 7 p.m. Eastern um, and live on YouTube at 7 p.m. Eastern uh, every Wednesday night. So it, it streams on both. And we talk to each other, but we also interview other writers. So you just mentioned Christina Baker Klein with The Exiles. She was our guest last week on Friends and Fiction. And it's wonderful because just like with your show here, you know, we get to ask those behind the scenes questions and really dive deep into not just the books, but kind of what makes the writers themselves tick. So um, if you're not there already and you love to read, we do hope you'll join us. It's just a friendly, welcoming community. You're uh, TBR pile, your pile of books to read will grow exponentially. We apologize in advance, <laughs> but if you love reading, it's, it's a great place to be, to just celebrate the love of books and to learn about the stories behind them. It's just so fun to hear writers talk to each other and realize that you also have a sense of awe and appreciation and, and are wowed by the talents of other creative people. Um, and also always hold on to that identity as a reader, appreciating yes. um, great writing, just like the rest of us do, even though we're not turning out bestsellers. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, hey, that's true. Writers are at their heart readers. I mean, that's why we go into it. So, um, you know, and the other nice thing I think about Friends in Fiction is that the five of us who run it, the five founding authors, really are super close friends. So what you're seeing on screen and the way we connect is, is genuine. I mean, we really love each other and we love, we love the readers who've joined us. So it's just a big old feel good community of love. <laughs> what a very cool sorority you guys have created, yes. right? <laughs> There's no hazing though. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> you just got to make it to that bestseller list and then you are in, <laughs> you are in. Um, I want to talk to you a little bit about, I think you're the beginning of your career is so fascinating. Having um, worked as a journalist, uh, People yeah. Magazine, even being paid uh, to be writing as a teenager. <laughs> so what were some of the more maybe surprising or, or, or formative moments of those early years that kind of led you to, to take this evolution and, and go to writing fiction? That is a great question. Um, so as you said, I did start off very young. I actually um, started pitching magazines when I was 16, uh, cleverly omitting my my age from the query letters because I thought, well, I'd like to be a writer someday. Why not now? I'll just start. Um, and so I ended up getting assignments from a local magazine um, who clearly thought I was an adult because you know, why wouldn't they? Um, and wound up uh, actually interviewing NFL players in NFL locker rooms, Major League Baseball players in Major League Baseball locker rooms, and as NHL a teenage players girl. as a teenage girl. And when I was, um, I'm only five feet tall. So when I was 16, I looked about 12. So I can only imagine, like at the time, I'm like, they must think I'm an adult, but I'm sure they thought like, what is this middle schooler doing here? <laughs> like, I just looked like a baby, um, which is crazy. But so that's probably, you asked about surprise things, that is probably the biggest surprise that I started off, um, you know, as a child doing that. But that kind of led to other things. I ended up working for the Tampa Bay Times, which was called the St. Petersburg Times at the time. It's a lot of times in one sentence. Um, and it, from there, I did some national magazine freelancing for Women's Day, American Baby, and Men's Health. And then I moved into an internship at People, which turned into a job. And so at People Magazine, 
I did a lot of cool things. I got to, I I think I covered three Super Bowls, which was amazing. I mean, what a cool thing to do in your 20s, right? To get to go to three Super Bowls. Um, The NBA All-Star Game, the MTV Movie Awards. Um, You know, I get to sit down with people like Patrick Dempsey, who's still just the nicest person. Um, uh, Ben Affleck, Matthew McConaughey. I mean, Justin Timberlake, like so many just interesting interviews. But the ones that I think led me directly onto the path that I'm currently on were the heroes among us stories at people, which were the stories of real, normal, uh, just everyday people doing extraordinary things. So basically finding light in the darkness, finding a way to be the light for others. Mm -hmm. And those stories were always so inspiring to me. And I learned, I really like to ask people, you know, why are you doing this? What makes you tick? Like what made you take this on when you didn't have to? Kind of all of those questions. And I think those same questions are kind of at the heart of what I'm doing now, which are these World War II novels that celebrate ordinary people rising up and doing extraordinary things in a time of darkness. Um, I think it's a path I didn't realize connected to my People Magazine path until the last couple of years. But I think there's a very clear through line from that part of my career to this part of my career. Um, And and, uh, it's just something I feel very passionate about writing about. How full circle for you then, uh, your books and your career documented in People Magazine, right? I mean, Uh, just to go like... It's funny. It's funny to look back with the with the uh, clarity of hi- of hindsight, right? And to say like, okay, yeah, now I understand why I, f- I felt so drawn to those stories, and I understand that they were leading me here. But you know, at the time, it just kind of felt like, all right, well, this is the assignment I have, and I I kind of like it, and you know, here we go. So it is funny to look back though and see how it all connects. Are you actually a sports fan, or were you just? Yes. Yeah. No, 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 no. I, I, well, I used to think I wanted to be a sports writer and what's interesting about that. So, I mean, that's why I started off pitching sports publications because that was my career aspiration at that point. I thought when I, I mean, I wanted to write novels one day, but first I wanted to be a sports writer and it was in the nineties. It was at a time when there were not a lot of women doing that yet. I mean, there were women doing it. Certainly there, the, the real trailblazers in that, I think, were maybe like the mid to late eighties, but it was still kind of unusual at that time. Um, And I think I wanted to blaze a little bit of a trail, but I, once I got started with that, um, it became clear to me fairly soon that it wasn't the actual sports aspect I was drawn to, but that what I was always interested in knowing when I interviewed people was what made you, like what made you the elite in your sport? Cause it wasn't, you didn't just wake up and become a major league baseball player. These were people, you know, who sacrificed and, um, and tried and had something inside of themselves that was, that pushed them to do this and that pushed them to persevere through difficult times. And mm-hmm. I think those were the types of stories I was interested in. And when I began to realize that I began to realize, okay, so I don't have to just be writing this about athletes. There are people in all walks of life who found ways to, um, to be extraordinary and to be elite and to kind of rise to the top of their professions. And I'm fascinated in all of those stories. Well, it's just like watching the Olympics. I mean, what, what I'm watching for are the vignettes about their lives and hearing from the parents about driving to the practices and all the tears and the injuries and all of that. It's all the the life that goes into it. 100%. And, but you know what, it's the same for all of us. Like wherever we are in our lives, it's interesting where we came from. Like what brought you to where you are? How did you wind up, you know, doing what you do? I I think we all have these stories that are, that are, you know, pieces of our past and, and pieces of what made us come to the point you know, where we are now. And I think those are the interesting stories to tell and they're the human stories we could all connect to. But yes, I agree with you. That is what I'm watching the Olympics for too. <laughs> and as a fellow um, petite person, I can only imagine walking in. I'm, I'm a towering five, one and a half. So oh, uh... wow. you are super tall. <laughs> super, tall. Super, super, super tall. My nine-year-old is almost as tall as me. So it, it's only a matter of time. Um, you mentioned that all writers are readers. And that is something that I like to ask all of the novelists we have the opportunity to speak to. Do you remember the book, the moment, the series of books that made it click for you or you thought, wow, I can have a lot of fun reading? Yeah, that's a great question. I remember when I was young reading the Bobsy Twins books and the uh, Nancy Drew books and the Hardy Boys books, but I wasn't reading the ones that, um, 
that were like the newer ones that I should have been reading in the eighties. I was reading the ones my mom read in the, in like the late fifties and early sixties when she was a kid. Cause my grandparents had an attic full of them at the entire series of all three of those, the Bobsy twins, Nancy Drew and the Hardy boys. So I think I fell in love with those books and with the idea that stories could take you someplace, but I, it was not, it was truly not until I read the diary of Anne Frank when I was 11 or 12, that I understood that books could do more than entertain. So obviously in retrospect, those Bobsy Twin books and Nancy Drew books, whatever, they, they were teaching me lessons. They were teaching all readers lessons about, you know, trying hard and, you know, doing things that are courageous and looking behind the scenes or looking beneath the surface, those kinds of things. But I thought they were just books for fun, books to, you know, read with your flashlight under the covers because you couldn't wait to see what happened next. And then I read the diary of Anne Frank and it was like a light bulb went on. And I realized books can change the world by changing the way that people think and feel. And that was a profound moment of realization for me because it's the moment that I went from thinking, okay, I would love to be a writer someday. I love to write stories, but I also want to be someone who changes the world. And I guess I can't do both to realizing like, oh my gosh, I can do both. I can do both by writing books that in some way make a positive difference in lives. Um, and uh, yeah, so th that book really set me on this path, I think in a big way. Well, beautifully said. And uh, this is just an example of, of that all coming to fruition. I mean, so satisfying and, and inspiring yeah, and um, really meaningful. So thank, thank you so you. much um, for that. I, I, I have to assume that this is going to be a big, gigantic movie. Um, I, I would, I would love that. Um, I, I don't know yet, but that would be cool. Um, you know, I, I, um, my very first book all the way back in 2006, it came out in 2006. I think it was optioned in 2005. Now I started off writing romantic comedies, but at the time was being called Chicklet. It was very much the age of, you know, Bridget Jones's Bridget Diary. Jones. And yeah, yeah, yeah. And like Sex and the Still City. Still my favorite also. genre. <laughs> right? It's so great. I, I love that genre too, but that's what I started off writing. And my first novel, which I, my disclaimer is this was not a how-to guide, I promise, not based on a true story. It was called How to Sleep with a Movie Star, um, a story about a woman who gets involved in a situation where the whole world thinks she's having an affair with a movie star, but really her love life is a disaster. Um, that book was optioned and it was my very first book, my very first experience with Hollywood. And I thought, oh my gosh, I, I'm going to have a movie. I mean, we had a big star attached. We had screenwriters attached. We had a producer who had optioned it. Like it seemed like everything had lined up. And that book fell through, the, the, the film side of it fell through. And that was the greatest lesson I could have been taught about Hollywood because it crushed me at the time. But I realized, okay, that can happen. This is how Hollywood works. And now I just have to commit to being along for the ride and enjoying the process. So a lot of my books have been optioned. None of them have found their way to the big screen yet. Um, but there are a few that are, I think, pretty strong possibilities right now. Um, but in the meantime, I will, I, I have committed to just delighting in the idea that it could happen. And, you know, going out to LA and having meetings about it and talking to people who are also creative people who are talking about their take on the book. So the whole process is enjoyable. And, um, but yes, it would also be enjoyable if a movie actually gets made. <laughs> As long as you get some very nice lunches out of it along the way. I there mean, have been some nice lunches and additionally some nice cocktails. So I cannot complain. <laughs> okay. Well, I think we just we just spoke with Jojo Moyes as as her, her film film was coming to, to oh, Netflix yeah, the last yeah. letter of October. And she said that was, I think, first option 16 years before, 15 well, years before. Or something. Sometimes these things just take a really <laughs> long time. Um, but you know, I will say another beautiful thing that has come out of that is that some of the people who have optioned my books and have not been able to ultimately take them across the finish line are still have, are still very good friends of mine. So that's another benefit. I mean, I, it's led me to these friendships with other creative people that I couldn't, that I would not have stumbled into otherwise. So I, I do like to think that there's a gift in everything. And you are absolutely right. Just because a door closed 16 years ago, as it was the case with her, doesn't mean that it can't reopen again. So, um, you know, le leaving it up to the universe with fingers crossed. <laughs> yes, absolutely. As we wrap up, I just, um, what is your schedule? How do you approach when it's time to hunker down and outline your next book and how much prep goes into it before you sit down 
to write. And if you could roll into that um, a tiny bit of advice for somebody who is an um, aspiring writer. It, your question is spectacularly timed because my five-year-old just walked into the room <laughs> telling me that my time apparently here is up. No, but um, no, I just, you're going to have to wait one more second, honey. So, so there, there is a pre-COVID answer and a post-COVID answer. So the, the pre-COVID answer is that, you know, I would, um, I would, I, so as I said, I have a five-year-old and I used to write when he was in preschool. Um, and that was a very easy, you know, it, it, they were, it was a confined, um, a defined part of my day that this time is for writing. And then I pick him up and we do our thing and, and, you know, we go back to life as normal. Um, COVID canceled preschool in the spring of 2020. And then we did not end up sending him back the entire last school year. So this last year, including the entire writing of the forest of vanishing stars was really in these stolen moments that I, that I, you know, had to find away from him. So um, I woke up very early and I would write in the mornings before he got up. Um, I would have until 8.30 and then my husband would have to leave for work. So I'd have to take over, you know, five-year-old duty um, or, you know, four-year-old at, at the beginning. Um, so that's been difficult. And, and I wound up working weekends this past year um, as well, which has made it a little bit difficult because my husband and I just don't see that much of each other, even though we're living in the same house, because it's like, we're just trading off the child and doing our, I'm so, um, okay. You're I, up. Yes. And so I'm, he actually, my son starts kindergarten um, in a week. So I'm looking forward to getting back to some kind of normal routine, but so that's my kind of daily schedule. And once we're back in a normal routine, I will work during the hours he's in school. Um, but overall, I write a book a year. So it's kind of just a schedule that never stops. So as soon as I'm on, as soon as I'm done with the creative part of the previous book, and the book is now in copy edits, and we're just worrying about things like, did you repeat this word too many times on this page? Or, you know, where do the commas and periods go and all that? Once we're into that phase, I'm already well into the research for the next book. Um, and, um, and, and yeah, the whole process just takes about a year total. So, um, and you know, now that I've been doing this for so long, I've written, I think, 14 or 15 books now. Um, it, it's not a, really a matter of waiting for inspiration to strike. It's just, you know, sit down in your chair and write because this is what you do for a living and you have to do it. You know what I mean? <laughs> no matter whether you're feeling inspired or not. Do That's it. right. Exactly. <laughs> there are expectations upon you now. Yes, there, there is a contract signed telling me I need to deliver a book by November 1st. So it's going to well, happen. We're glad that those contracts are <laughs> happening to keep you on schedule, to keep us um, entertained and, and, and feeling all of the good feels that come from your work. So thank you so much thank and you. best of luck to your kindergartner. I hope it's a fantastic thank school you. year. Thank you so much. That's and good luck. Fun. You said you have a nine-year-old. Good luck to yours. Yes. <laughs> Fourth grade. That's oh my gosh. I remember yes, fourth grade. Oh, that'll be a good one. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so Kristen, thank you so much. Uh, Kristen Harmel, uh, the book out, The Forest of Vanishing Stars. Do not miss it. And if you have not read Book of Lost Names yet, you can get it on paperback. And of course, thank Friends you. in Fiction, Wednesday nights. We'll see you there. Thank you. Thank you so much. For a moment with Margaret, we have said goodbye and thank you to the fabulous Kristen Harmel. And she is just so nice. And um, what an interesting career. I mean, here we are we're working in news and you think about that maybe there'll be somebody in our newsroom or one of our sports reporters or um, somebody who's going to be, you know, this caliber of novelist in the future. It's pretty wild. Yeah, you never know. And, and that's kind of exciting. Like, it's kind of similar to T.J. Newman. Like, she wrote her book... <laughs> Yeah. Um, as a flight attendant, and no, none of her coworkers really knew. So it's kind of a, a nice little thing. Margaret, tell me, are you working on a secret book right now? Not currently. Nothing exciting Not enough is jogging me. <laughs> I'm just trying to get through the never-ending TBR stack. I know, I know. And on another moment with Margaret Day, we have got to talk about the television shows that are keeping us from getting through the TBR as efficiently as possible because yeah. I have gravitated towards more TV <laughs> lately. And there's just not time for everything. Right. But we wanted to dig into, we were looking at some of the um, Goodreads challenges and stats for 2021 and seeing what people are reading the most so far this year. Yeah. And it's, it's great because we have actually talked quite a bit on the podcast and in our regular lives and book club about books that we have read and enjoyed. And for the most part, 
the list from Goodreads on what what are the most read books so far of of the challenge. Those who have accepted the Goodreads challenge, um, we have read between the two of us a very mm-hmm. large amount of these books. The number one book was um, the Midnight Library by Lit Midnight Library by Matt Haig, which we both read. It's it's really good. We've talked about that. Chris and Hannah's mm-hmm. Four Winds is on there. Anxious People, which was a book club. Yes. Um, but there are several books on that list that we have read that we haven't talked about and both uh-huh. really enjoyed. All right. Give me one of those. So I was given a copy of the guest list. Nope. Oh. Yes. Lucy Foley? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Is it the guest list? Mm-hmm. about the wedding yes so yeah yeah oh because i'm you know getting it somewhat confused with another book that i just read which is very similar called the guilt trip so i was making sure oh, i had yes. the right but yes right. it's the guest list and by lucy foley who also wrote the hunting party a similar kind of idea different friends and and different um perspectives of people going to this wedding in this very weird uh, location. It's just very un uninhabited, uninhabited. Mm-hmm. Um, except mm-hmm. for this, like one family. It's very ominous. It's, very ominous. Yeah. it's like an island out, way out. That's not very friendly to uh, people in general. And there's the perspective of the family that's running this estate where the wedding is happening, and the the bride who's an influencer and that's why this wedding is happening in a very specific location and the and the and the groom and someone someone dies you find this out very early on someone is dead you don't know who and then you're going through the different perspectives of the guest the guest list yeah. and everyone who's involved and i just found that so good i passed that one on to friends um shipped it off to a friend in california and said you have to read this book yeah I love that book as well and that was one it was probably only the second book that I had ever listened to on audio Mm. and I decided that I particularly enjoyed it because they had um the the narrator had kind of that like sort of Scottish I guess Irish sort of lilt that kind of you know soft really beautiful accents and then you know some of the names and and some of the phrasing Mm -hmm. is you know British English versus American English and so hearing them say it was very immersive um and then it just is so it's a moody she does a good job of creating that mood and that environment that's cold and misty and you know there's just um and and it's so many different narrators and then even with the audiobook they have it's not just one narrator it's like three or four people so there's a male voice and it's so it's really like listening to a movie or listening to you know a bbc you know radio show or something Mm -hmm. it was great and i i really liked that book so i still have not done the hunting uh party yet but i need to it's funny because you know we talk about authors who really put a lot of detail in their in the environment around these characters and there is a scene at the very beginning of the book where um a girl who wasn't you know her husband was invited to this wedding one of the um, best friends of the bride And she really doesn't want to go. She does not like this person. She's the one that feels out of place. Oh, she's like, this is terrible. And they're on a boat heading out to the island. And the way that it expresses the boat itself, the rocking, the ominous island ahead of them, how, you know, just expressing the, the different kind of terrain they're seeing, like these sharp, jagged rocks up ahead of them that don't look inviting, and her just getting sprayed by the sea coming up over the side mm. and her getting nauseous like you were right there like on that boat rocking around with her and i just loved that and i didn't listen to an audiobook so i really was you know churning through these pages feeling myself right there along with them and that you feel for her because it's that Anytime you feel a little fish out of water and you're really worried about making an impression or fitting in and you're worried about what you're going to wear or what you're, you know, how people are going to receive you, then 
she shows up basically barfing. Yeah. <laughs> and looking an absolute wreck. And you're like, oh God, that's the worst. Oh, uh, and well, and her husband having some sort of past, whether she believes it or not, about how friendly they really are, and her right. just keeping one eye open on both of them. And then feeling out of place and sick, she's just like, what am I doing here? And I know, yeah, this yeah. is not right. Um, one of the other books that is on the list that we I don't we don't think we have talked about just yet too much is The Wife Upstairs, which is Rachel Hawkins. So that's um, mm -hmm. also been a very popular read for 2021. And I loved this book. It was just really quick for me. It was, you know, it's got like a, a Lisa Jewell or a Sally Hepworth vibe. Yeah. And I happened to read it on spring break. So, you know, your environment always is helpful because when you're reading something on the beach, you're like, oh, yes, yeah. this is great book <laughs> yeah I'm feeling escapism right now um and I just thought it was a very quick page turner and it really kind of creates a very interesting tension and this affluent southern suburban neighborhood you know this kind of um you know, develops like community where everybody is all dolled up and there mm -hmm. was, you know, lots of charity events and lots of status and um, a woman uh, wife disappears and a, a our, our protagonist kind of emerges from being a, a neighborhood dog walker yeah. to the new wife, essentially, or the new wife to be. Um, of one of the husbands there in the community, and it's it's a uh, it's just a good thriller. It's a, it's just a quick, um, a really quick book that was I thought very satisfying. And as I understand it, um, the author Rachel, this was her first time in this genre because she yeah. writes young adult fiction, right? I think it was actually on a list as like a debut novel. Well, well, okay. where we wouldn't necessarily consider it a debut novel since it's not her first. It is her first in this genre, I do believe. Yeah. And I mean, I also read it. Really intrigued me. I actually had on had it on a list for an upcoming podcast episode. We are talking about neighbors, and mm -hmm. this is one that really stuck out to me. Is about about the the involvement of the people around you in your own little community. And I mean, to be fair, this book didn't really travel outside of uh, this small community. I mean, they went to a lake house. But other than that, it was very, very much entwined in what your neighbors mm -hmm. are up to. Uh huh. And it, the ultimate keeping up with the Joneses. You're very yeah. influenced by your environment. I mean, and she really, she took it up a level, going from dog walker to <laughs> on fianced. And I'm saying, I was like, how do you do that? Uh, goal oriented, I guess yes. is one way to put it. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but either way, we know when we're looking at these lists, we're doing pretty well, keeping our finger on the pulse of, yeah. of what's what's new and what people are reading and talking about, right? I always feel with those lists, like when I have read at least half of them, I feel really proud of myself. Like, yeah, yes. like, look at me go. And a lot of them I'm just not intrigued by because I'm, I'm not super into fantasy, so I don't feel too bad about, like, not having delved into that. But we... We seem to be doing very well with that, I think. Doing all right. Yeah. And we're still having some time for reality television. So, you know, speaking of multitasking and staying on oh, goal. Yeah. Margaret, thank you for this moment with Margaret, always keeping me inspired and um, trying, trying, trying to keep up, at least in some way with uh the tbr and with the reading pace that is yours that is unparalleled so oh, until nice. next time thanks everybody keep on reading let's know what you're reading i'm your host olivia fierro our producer is margaret stewart we want to hear from you so send us an email to olivia's book club at azfamily.com let us know what you're reading and check out the olivia's book club facebook group or you can follow along on instagram at olivia's.bookclub or margaret is at overbooked and overdue make sure to rate and subscribe to this podcast and please tell your friends